welcome everyone uh, to to the uh, to today's panel that's called the big question what is the future of warfare uh, this webinar series is a collaborative effort between the AI Institute and Dr. Bezwa Momani and myself, uh, Jean-François Bélanger, out of the Political Science Department. Uh, this series has been uh, funded through the Department of National Defense through a MINES, uh, a MINES grant, uh, mobilizing insight in defense and security. Um, today's webinar is the second of the series, uh, with more happening later this month. Uh, and in the fall. So if you're interested by what we have to offer, uh, please make sure to sign up and join the uh, the mailing list. Uh, we will cover different aspects of the debate and the discussion surrounding AI and warfare, and we're bringing together both technical and policy expert in uh, their, their area of expertise. Um, we will share a link to our event page in the chat uh, a bit later on for you to explore the upcoming uh, topic and speakers. We're also fortunate to be partnering with the Center for International Government and Innovation at CG, uh, who will be publishing an essay series in, two, uh, in 2022 that's going to be based off the seminar uh, discussion. So, as always, let's do some housekeeping first. Um, we want this to be as engaging as possible with the audience, so please send questions uh, in the chat during the Q and A with the Q and A feature. Uh, we'll spend roughly about an hour having this discussion uh about the future and warfare and what it means when it comes to ai and we'll save about 30 minutes at the end for q a from the audience uh know that this is recorded and that it will be posted in our engagement in our event page hopefully uh sometime next week let's begin they've been waiting very patiently to be introduced so um without further ado uh first i would like to introduce uh branka marijan and i hope that i pronounced your last name correctly uh, she's a, sen a senior researcher at Project Pl Plowshares. Um, there she leads the research on military and security implication of emerging technologies. Her work examines concerns regarding the development of autonomous weapon system and the impact of artificial intelligence and robotic on security provision and trends in warfare. Her research interests include trends in warfare, civilian protection, the use of drone, and civil military relations. Uh, she holds a PhD from the Balzili School of International Affairs with a specialization in conflict and security. She's conducted research on post-conflict societies and published academic articles and reports on the impacts of conflict on civilian and diverse issues of security governance, including security sector reforms. Uh, Branka closely follows the United uh, Nations disarmament effort and attends international and national consultation and conferences. Branka is a uh, board member of the Peace and Conflict Studies Association of Canada, uh, what, what was acronym is PAXCAN. Uh, on the panel with her today is James Roger, who's a war historian, a professor at the Danish Institute of Advanced Study, and a fellow of the London School of Economics. He works with the BBC, the History Channel, and he's the presenter of the Untold History TV series on Dan Snow's History Hit TV. James also presents the Warfare podcast, uh, on which I have the pleasure to attend. Uh, James advises government and international organization on the history of warfare, contemporary uh, security, and issues of weapons development. He's currently special advisor to the UK Parliament's all-party parliamentary group on drones, a UK MOD defense opinion leader, and an advisor to NATO and the United Nations. He has previously been a visiting research fellow at Stanford University, Yale University, and the University of Oxford, and he is co-founder and co-convener of uh, BISA War Studies, the War Studies section of the British International Association. Um, we will so basically we'll do uh, both of the panelists will open up the discussion with us with remarks, and then uh, for the time being, I will just we will just direct the rest uh, with questions. I don't know, uh, does one of you would like to go first? Happily. Let's go. Okay. Do you want to ask a question or would you like me to ask a question and answer it? No, I could. So let, let's begin with this. Uh, I think the first question that that, that, that will go, let, let's go straight for the big, big pictures. Is artificial intelligence and warfare in warfare spheres here to stay? And what do you think that the future of AI back warfare is going to look like, um, if if you do believe that it that it that it's here uh, with us? 
Well, it is a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And it's great to be able to discuss this with Branka. Uh, today, I'll be largely drawing on uh, my field work in the Middle East and my studies into the uh, terrorist use of drone systems and automated weapons technologies, as well as my studies into the history of warfare, of computational warfare and the developments of systems to help with precision targeting during the Cold War. So a bit of a mixed bag. So I'm great to have, be able to debate this with Branka and her very different field of expertise. And hopefully we can um, have a, a good and full discussion that covers a number of topics. Although I fear that if you do drones as well, we may end up talking a lot about drones, which is usually the curse of being a drone scholar. In answer to your question, JF, I'm really glad that you said, are they here to stay? Because I very much believe that this is not just a future technology, but it's something that we're currently witnessing within warfare and something that is very much transforming Western warfare, at least from my personal experience of studying this. We've got to think when we look at AI and automation, why was this term AI coined? Why was the field of study coined in the first place? Why was it established? And it was established in the 1950s in order to create a field that could look at technological systems that could make computers that could do the job of humans just as good as humans, or potentially, as you go forward into the future, to do them even better than humans. So as you look at contemporary warfare today, you've got to think, what is it within contemporary warfare that computers could potentially do as well or better than human beings? And it usually comes down to laborious tasks or tasks that are too vast for um, one human being to do alone or too costly to hire vast amounts of human beings to process it. And so what I'm leading towards here is data. I mean, the US military has drones that can hoover up 1.8 gigapixels of camera data and vast amounts of terabytes of data as they hoover them up from their listening stations at places like REF Menworth Hill in the UK, a NATO listening station. And they process and push all this through in order to try and find trends and patterns to identify potential targets and terrorists. Now, when you're hoovering up all of this data, it becomes almost impossible for a human being to do that. And so you create algorithms and computer systems and systems of artificial intelligence that can be pre-programmed or can indeed designate targets off a pre-designated algorithm that allow you to actually um, cut the cost and the time of doing this yourself. And we've seen this when it comes down to the US targeted killing program. When we've seen, like I say, at these NATO listening stations, they hoover up this vast amounts of metadata off phones and computer systems from across North Africa. They process this with existing data on their systems. So this could be um, important red flag telephone numbers, regions of uh, conflict and areas within that conflict that have been designated as, as terrorist active red zones. And then they triangulate all of this together and they create their own kill lists. And from this, your kill lists are then, of course, pushed through into policy. They are checked, usually, you would hope, by human beings. And then you have your drone sent out there to go and do the killing. Now, at this point in time, the human being pulls the trigger on those drones. But the one thing that we neglect in all of this is the fact you've already got AI and algorithmic warfare already doing a lot of the hard work of war for you. And from that, if we don't ensure that there are humans in there checking it properly, you start to believe that the computer can do it better than you, that artificial intelligence can do it far better than the human being, and you don't double and triple check that. And the amazing work of charities like Reprieve have shown that people have been mistakenly placed on kill lists as a result of this computerization of the processing of data in warfare and the creation of kill lists. You've seen journalists that have been discussing and talking to known members of terrorist or insurgent organizations that have messages back and forth that are trying to report on the conflict who are then being, because they tick all the right boxes to be placed on the kill list, are then placed on the kill list. And then it's incredibly hard to find out who's on that list and then to try and get them off it. So that is where we are at in terms of my understanding of just some of the ways in which AI and algorithmic warfare and the computization of warfare is being used today. And I think it's in those areas, those laborious areas, where it's going to be increasingly used into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Branka? 
Thanks so much. Uh, great to be with you here virtually, and uh, James, great to have this discussion with you. Um, I absolutely agree. I think there's a perception perhaps that AI enabled warfare is sort of a future distant concern. Indeed, there's a recent example that I think is fascinating and want to share with you. Um, there was uh, a few news stories, or a few, quite a few news stories, um, quite prominent uh, newspapers and uh, journals looking at uh, the use of the cargo to the Turkish cargo to loitering munition um, in Libya, which happened, you know, which was noted in a UN report from last year. But somehow, you know, it was picked up uh, by in a story and then it sort of started spreading and more and more stories about it started coming out. And the question that was asked, you know, has a fully autonomous sort of or weapon or a killer, you know, killer robot already been used? And what was interesting to me in that discussion is that we had experts in this field of arms control and disarmament, um, you know, this, debating this and saying, well, you know, it's a loitering munition. How autonomous was it actually? You know, can we sort of describe the degree of autonomy? Um, and on the other hand, you had the broader public and the media really starting to, I, I think, understand the concern with AI enabled warfare, um, you know, which to this point, I think has been largely seen as something that is futuristic and the fact that we are, you know, maybe perhaps a perception that we're talking about very sophisticated systems. And so the experts, you know, are very frustrated by the fact that this story, I think, got picked up and they, you know, they're saying tomorrow is a more of a missile. How should we categorize loitering munitions? Right. But I think that's missing the point. The point here is that I think the broader public um, and the media certainly is starting to understand the fact that artificial intelligence is being incorporated, is being used by militaries. We've already seen it being used in conflict. James has already discussed this in Iraq and Syria, Project Maven, right? Being able to, um, you know, the ability of a lot of systems already to be able to scan uh, targets and engage targets, um, that already exists. You know, we know that over 150 systems have that capability today. But what's important at the current moment is that, um, just to reiterate, that those, those sort of decisions over their use are still made by humans, and it is humans deciding to engage the systems. And if you think of fire forget weapons, it's still humans that fire, you know, that, that make that decision. And the concern really, um, you know, in terms of AI warfare is the fact that that level of human control over weapon systems is diminishing precisely because of some of the issues that James mentioned. There's sort of a reliance or uh, an overwhelming amount of data um, and uh, maybe uh, over trusting of that data. And so we're in this really interesting time now where I think uh, in some have called the you know, AI arms race. I don't, I don't know if it fully, you know, the political scientist in me wants to debate the arms race aspect of it, but there's certainly a global competition and there's certainly a lot of interest from various countries, particularly advanced militaries in, in using um, AI in weapon systems. And that's where the, there's a lot of concern. Not all uses of AI by militaries are equally concerning or as concerning. You know, militaries are looking to AI for back end functions, for logistics, right, for those kinds of uh, uses as well. But what's really interesting and what sets this technology apart from maybe previous um, technologies is the sort of um, is, is the fact that the, we are talking about dual use technology or multi use technology, right? These are technologies that are used for civilian, that can be used in civilian spheres. Um, and in the military sphere, the te you know, the technology they use to unlock your phone, you know, some, I'm sure people in the audience, some of you already have this, that's the technology we're talking about. And that's why it's so challenging to say, um, you know, it's not here to say, I mean, the reality is it's here to stay and militaries will use it in particular ways. And we really need to be thoughtful about how we sort of engage in these discussions, how we regulate these technologies because of, of this aspect of concern in terms of who is controlling, um, who's making the decisions, because that relates to two key points. One is about accountability and responsibility. Who is accountable for the system being used, right? Who made that decision? Under our existing international humanitarian laws, um, it, it, no one can really be held accountable. Our existing you know, humanitarian laws are not sufficient, international humanitarian laws or laws of war are not sufficient to address the challenge that is being presented here. Um, and the, the other aspect that's related to that is the fact that, um, you know, there's such a push for speed and a speedy response. 
So that introduction of AI system into critical decision making over weapon systems is quite concerning because of a potential for accidents, for conflict escalation. And that's where I think we, you know, we really need a lot more um, discussion because that push for speed and the appeal uh, of AI to militaries could result um, in quite concerning outcomes. I'll stop there. I know there's more to say <laughs> as we go on, Jonathan, so I missed. No, but it, it's, it's a wonderful start. Thank you very much, you too. Uh, we were finally able to uh, take care of our uh, technical problems. So I will uh, I will introduce you to our distinguished moderator, and I will fade in the background. Um, please uh, uh, allow me to introduce and welcome Vijay Ganesh, who is an associate professor at the University of Waterloo's Department of Electrical and Computer uh, Engineering, and he's cross-appointed with the School of Computer Science in the Faculty of Math and the co-director of the Waterloo AI Institute. He's also a member of the Waterloo Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute and the Waterloo Computational Map Program, and the Waterloo Blockchain Research Community. Uh, and he's he's been recently, uh, I've said it, but he's been recently appointed as one of the co-directors for the uh, U Waterloo AI Institute. So we're delighted to have him uh, with us today, and he's going to continue uh, direct the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, JF, and uh, thank you uh, for taking care of the situation. As this situation suggests, uh, technology, no matter you know how sophisticated and the user or the technology itself, things can go wrong, and that's a nice kind of illustration of the point being raised by some of the panelists here. So thank you, Branka and James, for coming on. And Branka, you were talking about accountability in the context of uh, the use of AI technology in warfare and how we can have accountability. So do you have any suggestion for um, how we can actually have accountability? Uh, how, how do we change the international legal structure to allow for accountability for users of AI in warfare? That's one question. But another question is maybe it might be pertinent to kind of give a background in terms of the various ways in which AI is being already used today and what do we really mean by AI being used in in the context of warfare? Like, what are the what are the next uh, kind of AI technologies that people are thinking of deploying in the context of warfare? So I'll start with Branka there. Go ahead, please. Sure, sure, Vijay. Yes, and great to see you virtually. And um, <laughs> and I do agree that you know these technologies not functioning well. It should be a real uh, wake up call for all of us in terms of the trust that we place in some of these systems. Particularly what's important to highlight, I think, is the use of these technologies in what are complex and dynamic contexts, such as warfare, right? We, we really have to be, I think, uh, much more cognizant of how different um, that context is. But to answer your question, I think that what we're really seeing a uh, focus on, I already talked about loitering munitions. I think countries, particularly following the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, you know, have started to pay much more attention to having these kinds of munitions in their arsenals. Um, the other technologies that we'll see, you know, uh, I think I always say make the statement, you know, the future of warfare is small and many. So there's a great deal of interest in swarming technologies, right? James talked about drones, and so now we're talking about really mini drones. And you can think of some of these, um, I'm sure some of you have seen the light shows, you know, there was one recently in Dublin for St. Patrick's Day, right, uh, that are used of these mini drones. Um, and that's the kind of technology that is, you know, could also be behind some of the systems you, that you would see in warfare. So that's why I stress that dual use nature uh, of the technology or multi-use nature of the technology because some of the same technology in autonomous vehicles, for example, is something that you would have in an autonomous ground vehicle used by the military. So this is, I think, what we are going to see. We're going to see more autonomous uh, vehicles, more autonomous systems, smaller systems, whose aim will be to overwhelm, uh, for example, is drones to overwhelm air defense systems, right? Uh, and it's very difficult to uh, guard against them, right, if you have uh, many small systems, 
what we're, you know, and this is none of this is hypothetical. Um, we've already seen demonstrations of drone swarms by the United States military. The UK has a contract with an Italian uh, defense company uh, that Leonardo that's demonstrated that they can do this as well. Um, there, there's already an autonomous sea, uh, sea vessel, right? The Sea Hunter from the US Navy. Um, so we're going to see these kinds of systems start to, um, I think, be incorporated by more and more militaries. And what's interesting also about this technology is that the barrier to entry is perhaps lower than for others. And maybe James will touch upon this more, but, you know, we see countries like Turkey in terms of armed drones, right, uh, being able to adapt and uh, develop own systems. And so that's that's where I think we're going to see a lot of these developments in terms of regulation or response. The challenge is really that regulation always falls behind, right? It's always, you know, it's always sort of um, much more slow moving. And so there's a real sort of need um, and opportunity here to to try and address some of this preemptively, right? To ban the use, for example, fully autonomous weapons preemptively. The challenge is, you know, with the pandemic and everything, uh, that we've had these discussions at the United Nations at the convention, certain conventional weapons postponed several times. Indeed, there was supposed to be a meeting in a few weeks' time that has been postponed as well because uh, a several, well, a particular country <laughs> wanted it to be done in person and didn't want to have this hybrid sort of model. And one of those countries is uh, that country is also very um, unwilling to have that kind of regulation. So I'm not going to sort of underplay the challenge at the international level, given the geopolitical realities uh, that we are in to sort of come up with those efforts. But I think there's, uh, you know, the important aspect of that discussion is to really highlight the global security implications of these technologies. And to me, what it shows is that we are going, you know, with the introduction of these kinds of systems that we're, we're not sure who's controlling, you know, these systems could um, engage in ways that we can't predict. So if you think of like flash crashes in the economy, you can think of flash wars happening, um, but there is a real concern about a deteriorating global security environment. And, and that's where that need for regulation comes from. And these talks at the United Nations, you know, are so important and necessary and, and needs to be uh, continued because we do need um, that regulation to come up, but it also needs to be a multi-level response. We really, it really starts from the designers on, right? We need to have a, a serious discussion because a lot of these uh, technologies are dual use about the development of certain systems and how they could be misused or, you know, um, or maliciously used, right? And that needs to really start from the designers on. So I see the need for a, an international, uh, you know, treaty and document, but also multi-level responses, uh, codes right. of conduct, and various things. Let, let me let James say get a word. Yeah. Here. So, so the the next question for James and kind of, you know, uh, from a history, you know, you're a historian, you're a war historian, and from a historical perspective, we have seen waves of te technology come in, and every time new technology comes on board, uh, militaries are, of course, only too eager to adopt them and adapt them for their purposes. So how do you see from a historical perspective the uh, adoption and adapt adaption of AI into warfare uh, going forward? James. Well, at this moment, I don't think we're discussing AI particularly. I think we're discussing perhaps um, the introduction of future autonomous or fully autonomous or partly autonomous weapons. And specifically, we're definitely talking about automation. And if you look back through even the recent history of the development of um, incredibly powerful computer-based weapon systems as a result of the revolution in military affairs, then we can say that the US reached its pinnacle probably in terms of actually advancements in this technology by about 1988-1990 and the publication of discriminate deterrence um, which is a publication from the committee on long-term strategic trends by albert wallstatter and freddie clay and they said how the us had now achieved the capability 
um, through ever smaller computing, ever smaller video cameras, uh, the establishment of uh, better long range transmission and control technologies, and then later with the introduction of, of satellites, the ability to strike anywhere in the world with a precision of one to three meters. And this was just a transformation. Um, now, as we've gone through, through the 90s and the 2000s, it's, this report has got a little bit lost, this, this report from 1988. And um, as I was digging through the archives, I stumbled across it once again over at, uh, over at Stanford in the Woolshatter papers, and there was a warning in there. And the warning is that this may be an American monopoly, but it won't be an American monopoly for long. You will see that other countries will copy this. They explicitly stated China in there as a country that will be able to um, industrially manufacture this technology. And once that cat is out of the bag, these nation states, these sovereign nation states, will be able to decide whoever they want to go and pass this technology on to. Now, I would argue that we've reached quite a disquieting point in that history where we now have, yes, China, but specifically we have Iran that is able to produce um, medium to long range precision technologies, um, those that can be controlled via satellite and preset targets, these fire and forget systems that are automated, and they can then spread them on to their non-state actor allies, proxies that can do their bidding for them. We've seen this with attacks on Aramco in 2019. We've seen the Iranians do it themselves with their attacks on Ain al-Assad in 2020. But most recently, just last Sunday, we saw again the fact that these systems had been passed along to Iraqi militias to again attack Ain al-Assad in Iraq, the largest base, the oldest US base in the country where you have US and British troops, and in fact, a large amount of our coalition forces based there. And what this shows to me is that no matter how high tech our weapon system are and how much we don't think they're going to fall into the hands of hostiles and our enemies, they inevitably will. And we've fallen behind on the countering here. We've focused too much on the offensive and not enough on the defensive. And so I've reached a point in my work where I argue that there's a transformation coming in Western warfare. We've relied far too long up until this point where we've conducted what we've called a bloodless war, I suppose, a surgical pinpoint precision, cost-free war, war that has been done with a, a light footprint, especially um, prior to 9-11, when we look at the wars in, in Kosovo or the Gulf War before that, and then post 9-11, we relearned that lesson with our remote warfare modus operandi. Um, and that allowed us to strike anywhere in the world and deploy small detachments of special forces and to assist our allies and forces on the ground. Now, with the spread of this automated technology, this fire and forget drones and, and precision missile systems, those very same small pockets of troops, and of course, we have our drone bases out there because our drones cannot be controlled unless there is a ground control system nearby to take them off and land them. These are very, very vulnerable and sensitive targets. And I don't understand how we're going to continue to deploy warfare in the way we have done over the last 10 years in the next 10 years, because we just don't have the defensive systems to protect our bases, our special operations forces that have quite large electronic signatures, and they can't just carry around a counter drone system with them because that just lights them up like a Christmas tree. And um, we've got a lot of questions to ask strategically and technologically about how Western warfare progresses, especially when we're in a context where our peoples and our publics are not ready for us to have high amounts of casualties to our troops deployed abroad in wars that until this point have been largely silent. I'm talking about wars in the Middle East, wars in the Sahel, especially, um, you know, how many people know how many troops are deployed in Niger and Mali at the moment and the things that go on there. I think we're gonna see some quite big changes coming over the next 10 years as a result of the spread of this technology. And as Branka said, the commercial aspects as well, which make it even easier for non-state actors to transform their rudimentary systems into high-tech sophisticated weapon systems. Okay, so let, let me kind of summarize at the kind of the middle of the this discussion here, the points that you raised. So AI in warfare is here to stay. AI is being used um, as a way to make some weapon systems semi-autonomous, being controlled remotely by people 5,000 kilometers away through satellites and and so on. And further, the the bar for entry for state actors and non-state actors keeps going down over time. That's what we are witnessing. 
one more point that was raised by Branka was there is a need for updating the policy structure, the treaty structures, the uh, legal structures, except they are so woefully behind that we don't know whether that's going to happen. And even if that does happen, who's going to stop China for developing even more advanced AI than they already have today, right? So, so these are all very strong questions. Now, kind of, if I may bring one more angle to this, so all of them are extremely concerning, but let me put one more concern on the table, which is cybersecurity. And as you know, cyber warfare is a real thing, and you can actually attack AI systems um, remotely. You can attack machine learning systems to uh, do all kind of bad things. Uh, and so do you have an angle on how hackers can leverage uh, attacks on AI system and use that as a uh, as a means of war? Uh, yeah, I either think- of you, Either of you can, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I think an excellent point that um, James made was about sort of the adaptability and the fact that the adversaries will adapt. Sometimes in this kind of discussion on the use of artificial intelligence or, you know, future systems, um, there's a, you know, there's a perception that the adversaries won't adapt and they'll adapt in different ways that will push the more advanced um, military to react in ways perhaps that they are not as equipped or re prepared for. So that's one aspect of it. In terms of the cyber sort of uh, discussion, absolutely, like none of these systems are going to be hack proof, right? They're all going to be hackable, which is so concerning, right? What we're worried about essentially is a country fielding a system that is then hacked by some, uh, you know, actor with malicious intent. And then we sort of say, well, you know, who's responsible there? How, can, you know, who? They could cause a, a, you know, another conflict to escalate. They could cause all sorts of problems. So there's a real concern about um, sort of that kind of cyber intrusion. The other aspect of James gave you a really nice picture, I think, of remote warfare and the kinds of practices that we've seen. You know, there's and then of course the, all the talk now is about irregular warfare and asymmetrical warfare. And so what we're seeing is a lot of state actors backing on state actors, a sort of state-sponsored, uh, you know, engagement where the engagements fall below that threshold of warfare. And that's where cyber, I think, is has really been used by a number of what we believe are states, right? Sometimes attribution is difficult, though not impossible. But that's where I think the concern is that these kinds of intrusions will happen that will fall below that threshold of what would be considered an act of war, but could still be very disruptive and could be very disruptive for ordinary individuals around the world. Because what I think remote warfare has done, and maybe James, you know, has some thoughts on this too, is, you know, you know, and I think this is also visible in the UK's um, integrated defense review, is this idea of, you know, we will engage when we want, uh, you know, in a manner of our own choosing, in a place of our own choosing. Um, so I think that's what's um, really cool. important to kind of consider um, and think about because we are, um, I think, at a juncture where some of those cyber um, actors really, you know, are going to take an opportunity uh, to disrupt ordinary lives and our infrastructure, you know, critical infrastructure, of course, is a concern. So I hope that all makes sense because it is quite a mixed picture, but because there's so much data, you know, being collected all the same time because we are so visible. And I agree with James, it's even hard for, you know, special operations really troops to, you know, keep those things secret anymore. I mean, there's there's that Strava leak, right? Which, you know, gave you sort of insight into where all the troops are and, you know, where all the different um, installations are. So we're in just a very different information environment where some actors in some states are perhaps more willing to engage in ways that um, kind of fall out aside of some sort of agreement that's been in place about what kind of activities you get engage in or not. Do, do you want to add to that, James, about the intersection between cybersecurity and AI or how AI systems can be attacked and... and yeah, I, th I think... Yeah, go ahead. I, th I think Branka, you know, largely made all the points that, that I would have made. I think that that's a, that's a great answer. I just want to return us to the, the, the point of this discussion, which is the future of warfare. And what is the point 
of warfare. Well, of course, many people would say that there is no point in warfare. But when politics fails, when diplomacy and discussion fails, war is there to compel your enemy to do your will. That is the point of warfare. And so if you can go through their systems that they believe to be infallible, if you can change the landscape of conflict to be more favorable for you, if you can make your enemy to make mistakes as a result of them believing what's going on as a result of their AI generated picture uh, or their AI generated strategies into the future, then you will win future wars. So the ability to hack into an enemy's AI systems is going to be the, the covert background aspect to any war of the future and it will decide the fate of nations and whether or not wars are won or lost that's how important it is yeah yeah there's an interesting comment in the q and a section that says all of this goes into a gray zone a hybrid and the disappearing boundary between war and non-war and it's like you know you're in this constant state of war but you're never really in a war you know it's it's a uh, it's a struggle, if you will, um, it, and that we see that in the cybersecurity environment because there are state actors that are constantly pushing and pulling, trying to hack into each other's systems, trying to find weaknesses and collect information about decision makers in, in the, on the other side. Uh, so this kind of raises the question, is there a solution here at all? Is there a uh, is there a legal or any kind of framework that can help uh, lower the, the possibility of accidental war, lower the possibility uh, of this constant low threshold warfare all the time? Is there anything on the horizon that would help? Um, maybe, for example, uh, treaties between nations. Uh, is that a possibility uh, or is that even enforceable? Yeah, I think, yeah, I, yeah, and I was just agreeing with James uh, before. I mean, just excellent point, James. I, I really do think uh, there will be adversarial attacks, right? There will be attempts to undermine whatever advantage you have from, from enemies. And to that question of, you know, how do we sort of respond with the regulation, Rija? I think there's so many different things that are needed. Um, and in the current sort of political environment, um, the challenge is to sort of ma make it happen. But what really struck me in the UN discussions on autonomous weapons, for example, is the number of countries that consistently showed up and engaged and listened to those discussions. I think there's very much a recognition uh, that this is an important issue and that they will have to deal with it. Um, it at the same time, you know, it's really a challenge for some of those smaller nations. I think they feel like, how can they sort of ensure um, through these treaties that, you know, these, these sort of larger countries, more advanced militaries will truly respect them and have that enforceability. Um, look, all arms control and disarmament, you know, these are good faith agreements. So, you know, we have sort of certainly enforceability mechanisms for some, but oftentimes it's quite challenging to ensure enforceability. But a lot of it comes from sort of creating a norm on how systems are used and how you would like them to be used against you. Because that one point James made about, you know, uh, about that paper that was lost <laughs> from all those years ago, you know, that point is excellent. I mean, the United States or, you know, or China or whoever will have a monopoly on the newest and latest technology, but that won't last long. And we saw that with armed drones, for example. Um, you know, so you will have some of that monopoly with that technology, but once it's created, once it's built, it will proliferate and it will spread and it will spread to actors that you might not have anticipated. So I think countries, I think countries have to think about that. They have to think about, do we want these systems to be used against us? And the challenge of some of these systems is also among allies, right? What if an accident uh, happens, you know, and how do you ensure that your ally knows that, you know, their troops are, you know, who are attacked? that that wasn't your intention, that that was actually a mistake created by a system. So, uh, you know, in international relations and political science, we talk a lot about perceptions and perceptions matter here so much because they will, you know, really truly be at the core of what, you know, what countries understand is happening with these kinds of technologies. So do we need international treaties? Absolutely. I think they're, they're 
badly needed, not just in this area where you think about autonomous weapons, but also there are implications for other existing uh, technologies and weapon systems. And if you think about nuclear weapons, right, there were some suggestions of maybe we should have like an autonomous hand, you know, uh, decide, you know, whether a, a nuclear weapon should be used or not. And that seems to me like the worst possible idea in the world. And I think, thankfully, the vast majority of the world agrees. So that probably hasn't gone anywhere. But that doesn't mean that we won't introduce AI into critical decision making where those other weapon systems will also be on the table. And so that understanding of the threat and how you respond to it um, could be sort of shaped by these uh, systems, which you know are not infallible, can be hacked, can be you know attacked in different ways themselves. So I'm sorry that there isn't a sort of a clear cut solution, but this really is a discussion that does require that what I talked about, that multi-level governance response. And it does, you know, start, there are different ways that different actors can engage into those discussions as well. So, I mean, this, from a historical perspective, you know, during the 1980s, the Soviet Union and the United States came together for disarmament. And they realized, I think there was a strategic realization that uh, you can't go on like this uh, with the uh, Soviet Union having more than 15,000 nuclear weapons and the United States having something similar. And so there was a, um, a coming together for from a very practical point of view uh, and signing these treaties, the START Treaty, for example, and so on. Uh, so from a historical point of view, from that thread of history, James, is there even a possibility of a meaningful treaty between say the biggest players in this in this arena china russia on the one side and eu and 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 uh, the united states say on the other united states uk on the other side do you think uh, is if you want to take yeah if you want ahead. to take the, the the lessons from history then let's go back to you know 1945 46 attempts on international control of nuclear weapons, the idea of there being one world united to control the spread of these weapons, or there would be no world at all. And then, of course, you have the arms race springing up from 48, 49, 1950. And then you have just an explosion of the amount of weapon systems that start to be created by both the Soviet Union and the United States. And this continues and continues and continues because each side believe that they can gain the advantage on the other and right. it gets to a point where you have to have and rely on the rationality and the rational behavior of human beings to try and bring that back into check when you see that there is mutually assured destruction and you reach a certain level that each state needs to make sure that they can guarantee their own security in terms of the security dilemma then you start to talk then you start to go through the 70s and 80s and make these treaties that try and keep it under control but up until that point there was discussions from the 50 not discussions there was implemented strategies and ways to create strategies that relied on early computer technologies the ibm 704 in the 1950s late 1950s and into the 1960s was the most powerful computer in the world by general curtis lemay um, the person that had been in charge of the fire bombings of tokyo someone who had risen up to become the head of strategic air command was in charge of American nuclear strategy. This is bombs away LeMay, the man who said that in order to destroy something, you have to destroy everything. He put this computer system in place so that you could play out exactly where you needed to bomb across the Sino-Soviet bloc to make sure that you could guarantee victory, to make sure that you could identify all the sites and the silos that you needed to and the cities that you needed to bomb. And everybody within that system found it relatively concerning but it was difficult to challenge LeMay and Strategic Air Command because they had all the money to buy these brand new computer systems and the other branch of the military did not have the money to compete or to even begin to understand whether or not that computer system could be right or wrong. Now, it got through to a point where you had to have a change of political administration and a change of the politics 
uh, and the people who were within the political positions under President Kennedy and those that had come from the Rand Corporation who thought realistically but rationally about nuclear war to scrap these sorts of policies of trying to grab as many weapons as possible in order to hit all of these targets as preset by an IBM 704 computer because it's smarter than a human being and to bring it back under control. And if that isn't a pertinent lesson from history about what happens when we believe computers know better than us, and also when only a small amount of people in power are able to understand in an esoteric manner what these system, systems are capable of, that what can go wrong. And I think actually, you know, Branka makes a really important point about we need to discuss this, we need to understand it, we need to debate it so that we can um, introduce controls on it. Not enough people do understand the current level of technology or where it is going. Just a small amount of people in China working on the latest supercomputers and a small amount of people in Silicon Valley, and they have the power then to move the policy is where they want to in order to benefit the ways in which they want to take this technology. It takes a long time for the rest of us to catch up, but it's only when we have caught up that we can actually make some rational decisions about where all of this is going. When it comes to the Cold War, that took a decade or two. So here, here is a provocative question then. So should the United, I mean, clearly the United States is investing billions of dollars in AI and warfare. So preemptively to set the norm, should the United States pull back a little bit on investment in this kind of technology? Um, and then maybe try to say, look, we are kind of just like you had, at least on the pa on paper, one could argue that the US does not invest in chemical weapons, right? I mean, there is a chemical weapons treaty and chemical weapons are easy to make, uh, relatively speaking. There is also some kind of a treaty on, on bioweapons, which are not as easy to make as chemical, but perhaps easier in some ways than others. Uh, and AI seems to be, you know, also AI in warfare seems to be easy for many kinds of actors. So should there be an effort to say we should all slow down in adopting AI into warfare and all the Curtis Lemays and the US military kind of slow down, please? And uh, uh, would that help? <laughs> Is the question? I'm not. I don't think that's going to happen. But uh, I'm just saying. That, that would be a, Yeah, that would be nice if it did. I mean, what the interesting thing to understand here um, is is uh, the fact that the United States in the within the United States defense community, there are sort of more extreme positions being pushed for. You know, I think there's someone recent had recently, relatively recently said. You know, we should. It's a moral. It's a moral imperative for us to use um, AI and weapon systems, right? So there are sort of voices in that defense community really pushing for AI um, and autonomous weapons, and the military to adapt, adopt more of it. Partly driven by that sort of, um, you know, sort of belief of the U.S. military that it has to be, you know, it has to have overmatched capabilities, right? It has to have the latest technology, the best technology. And the real the perceptions of where China is in, in relation to the US are, you know, un unclear a lot of the times. I think the Chinese are quite capable of certain technologies, but there's a lot of also, I think, hype and amplification of what China can do. And so we need a much more realistic conversation there, I think, and more engagement actually between the United States and China. And I agree with James. It's it's a small group of countries, small group of people. Um, and not all of them necessarily govern in government either, right? There's industry that's creating certain technologies that could be used and misused. So does the United States see itself as a responsible AI actor? And um, they certainly try to portray themselves as a responsible AI actor and take it seriously. And they w the United States also sees um, its AI efforts, you know, like they think of themselves as working with allies and they see as they see allies as being central to their AI engagements, future AI engagements as well in warfare. So I think there is room there to try and, you know, uh, for countries like Canada, like the UK and others to really try and engage with the United States to ensure that there are certain normative discussions that happen in terms of using AI responsibly. Whether that will happen, I think, largely depends on which voices in the U.S. defense community are listened to. If you have the more extreme voices that are being listened to, then I think um, it will be a challenge. The EU is also quite interesting in that regard as well, because the EU came out with this position, you know, of a strong privacy 
uh, oriented, um, you know, AI development, uh, you know, really thinking about certain high risk uses of AI sort of not being allowed and banned. But then that really falls on the EU countries to implement um, and, you know, and different EU countries have different positions like Germany, I would say, is much more thoughtful about the use of AI by militaries. Whereas France, um, in you know all of their statements and position papers, from what you can see, is they would really like uh, AI to be used by the military. So you know there is this normative discussion that has to happen. That and I'm really glad you pointed to the biological and chemical weapons conventions, uh, Vijay, because you know I think these are quite useful for understanding how to respond to that dual use aspect. Uh, of the technology and the nature of, you know, in the way we could potentially put this into international treaties and agreements and documents and the way we could monitor it. Um, so that that's my take on it. I think it would be really great to have the United States be quite considerate and thoughtful. Um, China is really interesting in international forums, like on autonomous weapons. They claim that, you know, they support a ban on offensive uses of autonomous weapons, but not on defensive uses. So that slippery slope right, is uh, between offensive and defensive um, is something to kind of watch and see how they will sort of explain that more. James, any thoughts on that point? Yeah, Edison once called electronic electricity and the invention of electricity are a field of fields and so when you think of ai in a similar manner which i do how would you start to think about controlling or stopping the advancements of electricity within warfare and allowing it to continue within the rest of society well it, it just doesn't work on that like that so i don't think that you have this broad brush control on the advancements of ai and you have very little chance of stopping the technological advancements of human society um with this in mind, I think I agree with Branka that you can focus around specific systems that you don't want to become AI or autonomous or fully autonomous systems, right? So for some, that could be offensive weapon systems. Maybe that is the line we draw in the sand and maybe that is what we discuss at those UN levels and create agreements around. Maybe it's defensive systems. You know, you look at the mistakes that take place as a result of air defense and the shooting down of civilian aircraft when humans are in the loop, when they are fed information by computers in a semi-autonomous manner and asked to um, take that decision uh, within a matter of seconds, whether or not that's an incoming missile or if it is a passenger jet, as happened in January 2020 with PS752, the Ukrainian flight that was shot down by an M1 Tor defense system in Iran as it thought US cruise missiles were coming in. It turns out that it was those crew were believing what the computer system was telling them and they, they took the shot. Do you want to hand that sort of thing into the hands of an AI system to identify this? And, you know, throughout recent history, there have been a number of cases of those systems making mistaken identification of what they believe to be military targets, but are actually um, civilian targets. And those systems sometimes um, may well be deliberately spoofed as military targets or civilian targets to make a country shoot down a certain system. So there's a lot of subterfuge that can go on in those places. Then I have to put all of that with a bit of a caution, because as we enter an age of the uncontrolled proliferation and advancement of swarming tactic um, drones, fire and forget drones, that, you know, ISIS were using, you know, from my interviews, 84 drones in the sky above US troops within a 24 hour period. How do you control um, the airspace above incredibly sensitive sites, including nuclear sites, without introducing an AI or autonomous air defense aspect? Because like I said at the very beginning, the whole point of this is to be able to do things better and quicker than a human being can. And when you're inundated with a, satura a saturation attack onto your forces that cannot be um, defeated by human quick cognitive thinking alone, then you need to have that computer element in there. So actually, AI air defense in certain places could allow us to have stability, allow states to feel secure around their important sites, whether they're second strike nuclear sites as well, remember. States need to be able to have their deterrence posture in order not to want to do a first strike because they feel insecure. So do you have the advancement of AI air defense to ensure that nuclear deterrence and our delicate balance of terror is kept in track? Um, these are the sort of discussions. It's not as simple as thinking we'll just shut this one line of investigation off or shut it all off. But these are the debates that we need to have at the highest levels. 
So now I would take the discussion in a slightly different direction, which has to do with accidents, right? So accidents happen and uh, accidents with AI systems can happen. Uh, for example, it's possible that uh, we know that uh, uh, viruses have leaked from labs in the past. I'm not referring to the Wuhan lab leak theory here, but it's possible that you know these can leak and cause a lot of damage. So who gets held responsible? Similarly, autonomous um, weapon systems can be uh, accidentally engaged in some kind of warfare. And then how does how do nations come together and resolve that issue of, hey, you started the war and I'm responding to it. No, no, I actually didn't start the war. It was completely autonomous. Uh, so what, what, what policy do we come up with to address such a situation, if any? Yeah, that would be very difficult, I think, and maybe a primary driver for countries to understand the need for sort of normative discussions because they will um, you know, the concern is not only will you, um, you know, will, will there be this accident and you will have a hard time saying, well, this was an accident that, you know, the AI system decided to do this. It wasn't our military sort of intent. It wasn't our goal. Um, and, and that is sort of going to be a real challenge for countries. And I already sort of made this point about not just with adversaries, but also sometimes with allies. And you know, right. James rightly pointed to all of these incidents, you know, accidents that we've seen with other systems um, right. in the past. And so that's, I think, could be a, a driver for countries to really come together and say, you know, we, we need to address this because there will be accidents. And, my worry is that then we'll have certain systems that there is already a response back before you can have that discussion to say this was an accident, right? So that you will have those conflicts escalate um, and that that sort of uh, response will already occur. Or if you have, you know, a really advanced militaries pitted against each other, that their systems, their air defense systems, are, but we'll already have started reacting and other systems will start reacting before we have that discussion. And that's something the militaries talk a lot about, right? They talk about the speed of warfare, future warfare changing. The wars will be fought at really, uh, you know, at incredible speeds, and that's why they need these kinds of systems. But that's why we need to have that discussion of, you know, is that kind of speedy response always good and necessary, and what are the concerns with that? So I think that's where I would sort of also bring some, I think, attention to that aspect of it. You know, the fact that you will have a response back without that opportunity to engage and explain indeed that it was an accident. Right. James, any thoughts on that point? Well, I think you've just described the plot of Dr. Strangelove and right. the, uh, the doomsday machine that happens in that particular instance. And the fact that once events get out of the hands of human control, there's nothing you can do about it when you allow a, a machine to do the reading of the situation for you and there's no turning back. Um, and then, of course, discussions of a, a bunker gap and everything else. Um, but I just want to bring it back to, a, again, a pertinent example. I talk about January 2020, something that feels like a long time ago because a lot has happened in the meantime. Um, COVID has, has taken over all our discussions of this, but the US did conduct um, a strike, an extrajudicial killing of a state actor by drone, General Soleimani, um, in a third country nation violating the sovereignty of that nation state, Iraq, without its permission. And then in response to that, like I said, Iran sent its precision guided missiles um, to go and strike a US Air Force base. Um, hurting a, a number of people, traumatic brain injury to around 150 troops. And then at that point, they're expecting direct retaliation on Tehran. As I mentioned, um, the Iranians then shot down the Ukrainian airline flight, killing everyone on board. They did that because they were told something that was incorrect by the computer. There had been a miscalibration, apparently, of a certain amount of degrees of where they thought they were, and they thought that an outgoing civilian flight was an incoming flight because of what their system told them. What if that had been a US passenger jet that was shot down? In that tense moment, right then, back in January 2020, when the headlines were saying that we were on the footing to war with Iran, with President Trump's bellicose rhetoric stating that he will destroy the cultural sites across Iran, what would have been the response there and then from that one mistake? Mistake by a human being reading computer-generated information. And how quickly would it have been for the US to have responded or to believe that this was a mistake? 
as the Iranians stated. There is some food for thought for us, especially as air defense systems will likely be and already are the systems that will automatically be the first that are fully um, AI and autonomous. All right, so in the remaining about 20 plus minutes, we'll uh, go to some questions here. Uh, so let me uh, state one question which says, we know that international law is based on the will of major states. Do you see these states eventually accepting to modernize the law of armed conflicts to make it more binding and enforce accountability with respect to AI warfare? So this goes back to a point that we already discussed, which is, would there be a, <clears throat> a states coming together to agree to um, some kind of global treaty of sorts that are binding and enforce accountability with respect to AI, perhaps just the AI part of the of, of a warfare? Um, either of you can take a shot at that question. Yeah, I think there's already efforts, right, with autonomous weapons, and that discussion is that on a narrow use, right, like on a specific use yeah. of AI that is on weapon systems where the selection and engagement of targets is done without meaningful human control. So we know some 30, 30 uh, states already support a ban on these weapons, and many more are sort of, I think, concerned, and there, there are quite a few uh, countries the, among the most powerful countries, of course, that are opposed to this. So, you know, we could, I think, see this kind of treaty come to fruition if there is more normative building, if countries really come together. Um, when we look at, you know, I'm not a historian, this is James's specialty, but when we look at past disarmament and arms control treaties and how they've come together, there's there's been a bit of a recipe for how they develop. There's a certain number of you know key states who start championing this issue, and then key organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross or the ICRC come on board as well and highlight why it's why new law is needed. You know, in terms of international humanitarian laws, um, and then that sort of issue starts developing more in the various forums, and we um, eventually end up with some sort of agreement or treaty, and at the moment, you know, in the current situation, that that sort of length of time that it usually takes for these discussions to result in something is a bit worrying because of the development of the technologies, right? I mean, you can just look at the Boston Dynamics robot, right? Uh, the, in, in the years since it was first made, you know, it was wobbling and then um, and then it could, you know, do Parker and do backflips and things. And so I think te technology will advance and these regulatory discussions need to be, um, you know, equally sort of nimble and flexible in ways that they traditionally aren't. But I think if countries really start understanding uh, the wide impacts on global security, that, you know, there could be some of that emphasis. And it has happened in, in the past as well. So maybe um, maybe there is an act, you know, an issue or something that or an event that drives that forward, that need for it. So it would be, I think, necessary and it would be great to see it, but it will be sort of ultimately up to the different states um, if, if that is actually something that happens. So uh, given your read of history, uh, James, is there a possibility of this kind of, I mean, we touched upon this already, but maybe a, a, not a um, kind of a, a treaty or legal scheme that's <clears throat> binding, but maybe something much more weaker uh, and I, I cannot for now um, come up with some term associated with that, but perhaps you can comment on it. I mean, in my work, I've, I've um, advocated, I've, I've co-authored UN reports, I've, I've led on sections of UN reports about this, and I push along with um, Agnes Kalamar for the creation of things like a drone technology control regime about how these systems will be sold and the agreements on their sale of how they will be used in conflict. And maybe that's something that we could develop in the future around AI on autonomous weapons. However, I am incredibly skeptical. Why would the world's superpowers do something that is deemed to be against their best interests from their own point of view. You're talking about changing international law here, and perhaps the laws of armed conflict, um, those based upon the premise of a just war, those about being proportionate and discriminate in conflict. Well, the whole creation of the spearhead of the US arsenal 
is based around being able to continue to deploy force effectively around the world whilst maintaining, um, at least on the surface, within the constraints of international law. One thing that's always puzzled me, why, why are drones controversial when they are the most precise, proportionate, discriminate, international law abiding in so many ways in terms of the use of force weapons that are out there? Well, you turn back to the late great Professor Nicholas Renger and his work on just war and the international order. He argues that these particular measures of international law are shaped because they benefit the great powers, the superpowers. Um, and AI, as I've heard many times over and over again, and perhaps it's true, can help with those principles of distinction and being proportionate in war, ensuring that you take the human error out of the fold and you hand this over to a computer that can do it better, quicker, more effectively, without getting civilians caught up in the fighting. Now, in my work, and I've got a book coming out on this about the precision myth and how this has been long the case since 1917 when America first established its precision bombing doctrine in reaction to the First World War, um, precision and you know whether it's done by AI or whatever just means guaranteed destruction, guaranteed death and destruction. And no matter how advanced these computer systems are, they're still going to make mistakes and they're not infallible. And it's the thing I keep repeating all the way through now. However, you have to burst that bubble and break that mold and we've not done it yet. And proportionate and discriminate elements are still enshrined as core parts of international law. And we haven't come up with the mechanisms that will be adequate to replace them. And so we need to have that discussion before we go away and disregard uh, these principles entirely. So you mentioned uh, Boston Dynamics. It's a company that makes these ro robots, humanoid robots that are amazing. They can dance and they can jump and do backflips. So how far are we from a killer robot army? I mean, uh, in many ways, uh, it's easier to deploy them. There is no death uh, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, nobody's going to mourn the death of a robot, I presume. Um, and so, yeah, so why would generals and decision makers in the highest level not be tempted to start preparing a, a battalion of killer robots? Yeah, I think what James has really been pointing us in, in the direction is is to really situate these systems, right? So, um, you know, we really need to be clear that these are systems that will be used by states. We already have, you know, precise in quote, quotations there, James, weapons you know by different countries that then aren't used very precisely because of whether it's military you know a certain military goal or whether the country just doesn't care you know we see this in yemen right it's not that the you know the side bombing the civilians in yemen doesn't have the precision weaponry they do but they just don't care at some point right so i think we really need to i agree demystify these systems because i think when people think killer robots, right? And I brought up the Boston Dynamics, so this is totally on me. They're thinking maybe the bipedal robots, but those are not the kinds of systems that we're going to be seeing. And that's where I think the Cargo 2, the loitering munitions, the small drones, those are the kinds of systems that you need to think about. And so once you start thinking about these systems as killer robots, as autonomous weapons, you start realizing that, you know, this sort of myth maybe, uh, or a sci-fi kind of idea of different systems just fighting different systems and humans not being impacted is just that. It's a myth and it's fiction and it won't be the reality of conflict. What will happen is these systems will be used in ways for countries or states to ultimately um, you know, reach a particular goal or their interests and they will be used in you know, civilian settings. They will be used, and this is indeed what we're seeing, right? I think someone in the chat mentioned this blurring line between conflict and not conflict. And this is, you know, this example of the Soleimani, you know, killing is, is an example of, you know, the sort of just the spread of uh, activity of military engagements in what are non-traditional zones of conflict, right? We wouldn't consider this to be a particular uh, country at war that you would be engaging with. So I think that's that's much more of a realistic understanding. And when we talk about killer robots, when we talk about autonomous weapons, we're ultimately talking about existing platforms in the next 10 to 20 years let's say we're talking about existing platforms being used 
you know, with sort of computer enabled or AI enabled uh, capabilities. And it will be a challenge, I think, sometimes to know whether it's in an AI enabled system or whether it's a highly automated or highly autonomous system and what the level of human machine interaction in these systems is. And that's where we need these, you know, expert discussions at the at the highest levels to to continue and to really be informed by people building the systems, right? People creating the technologies. They also need to be a part of that uh, discussion because they could be developing something, you know, um, you know, a computer vision program to scan, um, you know, basic items at a store. Yeah. But that same sort of technology can be used by the military for very different purposes. So that's, I guess I've just been calling for much more thoughtfulness uh, on, on this issue um, and understanding of, and a broader understanding of, of the kinds of systems that we could potentially see. James, you wanna add something to that? Yeah, I suppose, again, what I've been saying all the way through is when it comes to AI, since its conception in the 1950s as a field, we're looking at ways in which we can uh, do things better than humans or do things that are boring and laborious that humans don't want to do. So when it comes to warfare, I think the advancements in terms of robotics that you're going to see, and you talk about Boston Dynamics, you're talking about logistics, aren't you really? Right. And you're talking about transportation. Um, they're the ways in which, and, and they're, they're, they're bloody costly when it comes down to human beings as well. So you want to be able to have endless streams of logistics and everything going backwards and forwards between the battlefield with less risk to human life. Um, when it comes down to drones as well and, and killer robots in that respect, then you're certainly going to have a use for those um, when it comes to replacing the incredibly costly and often very boring job of being in a, a jet fighter or a bomber or conducting reconnaissance. Again, a computer, a robot can do that. And then you have someone who can clock in at a point and then take the decision to kill. Or perhaps you will have... Um, drones all around the world controlled by one computer system and one pilot and they would just report in when they find a target and it can be approved or dismissed or the strike could be taken and then the human being can say whether or not that was right or wrong again that's that maybe that's what's going to happen or indeed it is already happening but that will usually only happen in an asymmetric conflict when you don't have a side that can shoot down those systems which are still relatively simple to shoot down when it comes to it if it's a peer-on-peer -peer conflict then it's going to be the high tech systems and usually crude systems at the moment that will be competing against one another for air superiority um, because human beings can do it better at this moment in time when it comes down to the future of this and um, you call, talk about killer robots um, what about robotic generals and decisions being make and taken behind the scenes, the way in which information that is coming in from vast different parts of the world is coming through and being processed? Think back to the Second World War of teleoperators taking it in, coding it, putting it up on a board. All of this can be done within a computer. In fact, it can be wargamed on my laptop right now. Now, you generate information and data through that, and then how do you generate the best decisions to take from that? Especially especially when warfare is coming quicker and quicker and quicker and faster and faster. How do you close that OODA loop so you can make the decisions quicker than your enemy is going to be making those decisions? Well, you can allow AI technologies, computer systems, to do that quicker and potentially better than human beings. And is it from there, then, that you have an AI Clausewitz? You have the ability, and the reason why I say this, of course, is because it's only recently that the first um, AI computer system built a, uh, beat a human being in the strategy game go and they did it by doing moves that have not been used by humans in its two and a half thousand year history and so do you have an ai system that creates whole new ways of doing warfare that outsmarts your enemy do they come up with the equivalent of a blitzkrieg that completely side blinds the french and allows to a defeat in six weeks so do they come up with a version of wellington hiding his forces behind the horizon and the rim so you can't see how how big his forces are, lulling Napoleon in and leading to defeats at the Battle of Waterloo. Do you see this as AI generating whole new ways of doing that, what we've believed, a very human practice of war and strategy and winning wars? That's where I perhaps see the biggest advancements. And because we really don't have much of a choice when it comes to the amount of data that's being hoovered up. It's really hard for it to be processed quickly by humans. And if supercomputers can do it quicker and quicker than the enemy, then that's how you're going to win the wars of the future. 
Right. Um, so maybe one final set of questions. So uh, in geopolitical terms, uh, it's been said that the 21st century will be defined by the competition between China and the United States, right? And China has been coming up fast. It has uh, improved its economy amazingly. Uh, it's uh, military capabilities, it's technological capabilities, et cetera. And the question that I have is, would AI hasten that process where China then ends up being the dominant power between the two? Or it's hard to say, or will the United States continue to be the dominant uh, superpower for the another 100 years? That's a long time, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, a, it's a, yeah. that's a challenging uh, question, I think. Um, and, you know, I think anyone with a political science background is notoriously bad at forecasting. But I think what's really interesting with the US and China competition is the way that it's impacting the rest of the world. So sometimes it doesn't matter if, um, you know, China actually has the capabilities that the US perceives that it has. All that matters is that perception. And I go back to perception because here I think there's a lot of, um, you know, maybe I, I've already said hype, but just sort of understanding where China is and how it sort of is conducting its, um, engagements globally is, is really something that countries will have to pay attention to. And they're doing it in quite interesting ways in international forums, right? They stepped into the discussions when sort of the United States pulled back a bit. But in terms of this kind of technological advantage, um, you know, some great reports from the United States do highlight that, you know, it, it's a much more um, interdependent relationship between the United States and China in terms of technology and the technology creation that is perhaps um, maybe visible to everyone if they, you just pay attention to the latest sort of discussion or debate between China and, and the United States. So I think we need to kind of have a better understanding of that, uh, have a better understanding of what is actually China capable of and what is the United States interested in. And this is a this is an aspect, this is a discussion that, like I said, impacts every country around the world. And so we, you know, in Canada and other places, we really need to be, um, I think, looking at this sort of competition to understand uh, how it could impact um, everyone and to try and build those relationships. I, you know, I'm a big fan of diplomatic engagements. I think this is, this is, you know, where we need to go with this. We, you know, the sort of the potential pitfalls and implications of some sort of um, military response or engagements uh, on various issues is is quite concerning for everyone. So we think, you know, we really do need that kind of diplomatic response. James, China versus U.S. and AI. Oh, so you yeah. want us to predict what's going to happen over the next century? Well, well it's, it's not just China versus U.S. and AI, but that. The fact that if China were to become better at AI, as you said, AI is about making everything more efficient, would they become a superpower that's a, a, a bigger superpower compared to US faster? And, and will you have a, a peaceful transition of power, like yeah. between the superpower of, of Great Britain and, and the United States handing over that mantle? Well, I think it's very much going to depend on what each nation state wants to achieve in terms of their forward planning. I think that both are going to have to play a game of give and take in terms of trying to keep that balance of power and that stability within the international system. And so it's going to take an awful lot of restraint when it comes over to strategic choke point issues like Taiwan or perhaps Chinese um, interference in, in US uh, technological practices or state infiltration or perhaps challenges across Africa in terms of proxy wars and proxy conflicts. But we've seen a lot of that during the Cold War as well. And you were able to maintain a level of long peace, as, as Gaddis might say, with some quite intense hot pockets of conflict 
and very much real wars going on in the background that allowed them to maintain this balance um, without actually resorting, of course, to full blown out war between the two partners. And I would argue that is what you're going to see uh, in the near future. We're saying that we're re-engineering and reorientating our forces for a peer on peer conflict. I think that we're doing that to prepare and ensure that there is a balance of power in terms of the security dilemma between these two superpowers. However, it will spill out at the sides with smaller proxy wars and the um, the stoking of uh, terrorist organizations as well to do biddings for them. Um, one thing I would caution with, and perhaps this will be my final point as we come to an end, is we're always told that we are so incredibly globalized that it's impossible that we could ever go into a world war once again or for there to be war between the superpowers. How can China and the US go to war? They're so interconnected. Well, so was Germany and Russia in 1949 and 1940. They'd literally built an entire military complex together. In fact, if it wasn't for Russia, the Soviet Union, then it wouldn't be possible that Hitler was able to amass the forces they did as they were cooperating on scientific and industrial um, advancements together. And I'd look at the work of Dr. Ian Johnson there at Notre Dame, who's doing some fantastic stuff. And of course, the UK was very much intertwined with its global empire of and, and they were within international organisations together and they were trading together. Um, but these things can easily be broken when you have the ambitions of a nation state that wants to become the world superpower. So like I said at the beginning, it depends on what we read the intentions of these nation states to be. So thank you with that a wonderful set of comments and uh, we'll come to a close. We are at the end of uh, our session here. Thank you so much, uh, Branka and James for fantastic uh, session and uh, answering all the questions so well and so clearly. Thank you again. And thank you for the participants for their questions as well. So with that, I would clap for the entire group of people who are in attendance. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.